Here in front of me, I have a statement. It says, I will miss this miniseries when it's over. And if you share the sentiment, thank you very much for sticking with us and uh, watching the five-part miniseries on Josh Academy here. Make sure you leave a like and comment on all the videos. And uh, remember, you can always watch it again, so there's no need to miss. But that's not what we're here for. We're here because we want to find out the negation of the statement. What's the opposite of the statement? Well, it's simple. It says, I will not miss this miniseries when it's over which it kind of hurts, honestly. So I hope none of you have that sentiment. Um, so uh, anyways, that's beside the point. The point is that we're here to talk about negations and why do I bring them up? Because now that we have a good understanding of different epsilon delta uh, techniques and concepts, we can now use epsilon delta not just to prove that a limit exists, but also that one does not exist. So what do I mean? The definition of epsilon delta, as you should know ingrained in your mind by now, is for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero such that if x is within delta of c, then f of x is within epsilon of its limit. So how do we negate the statement? Well, notice right away, it says for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists, which means this for all is a pretty big generalization for all epsilon, really. Well, if we find just one, all right, just one epsilon for which this does not become true and that the delta cannot make it work, then we just prove that the limit does not exist. So what do I mean? Let's take a look at this example though, because you might be asking, is there an easier way? Because I still understand, even though I understand epsilon delta better, I still don't really want to use it that much. Well, there is. So take for example, the limit as x goes to zero of one over x. It does not exist, right? And we know that because the limit as x goes to zero from the positive is positive infinity, while the limit as x goes to zero from the negative is negative infinity. And remember that a limit only exists if and only if its two sided limits are equal. So if the limit as x goes to c from the right and from the left are both equal and agree on a value that's l, then the limit will be equal to l. So maybe we can prove the one sided limits are not equal first by splitting them into two parts. So for example, we can say limit as x goes to zero from the positive of one over x is equal to positive infinity. And then we say limit as x goes to zero from the negative of one over x is equal to negative infinity. Then perhaps if we prove these statements true, then we can say that these are not equal and therefore the limit does not exist. So you should know how to do this by now. And there's a little bit of a hint here already. We're using m delta. So let's use the first statement first. So that means that there's for given an m greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that, and remember now the one side limit, x is less than delta implies that one over x is greater than m. So if we take the inverse of both sides of this, we get x is gonna be less than one over m. And right away you see your connection, delta and one over m. So if you choose in the scratch work, delta to equal one over m, then this assumption still holds. So for the proof itself, let's say, suppose, and don't forget to put on pf for proof, suppose that delta is equal to one over m. Then by this definition here, you have x is going to be less than 1 over m, and then that just immediately follows that 1 over x is greater than m, so you're done. How about the other side? 0 from the negative. So that means that we have a negative infinity, so it's m less than 0, okay, which just means it's a negative value. And we're going to choose a positive delta such that, and remember now, it's the left-hand side, so if negative delta is less than x, will imply that 1 over x is going to be less than m, right? We want it to be even more negative, so even smaller technically. So how do we go from here? Well, it's gonna be the same thing as saying that x is going to be greater than one over m, right? Because we flip this inverse. And if x is greater than one over m and x is greater than negative delta, then if we choose negative delta to equal one over m, you might be confused at first and saying delta is negative, and then when you take delta equal to negative one over m, how does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because m is already a negative value, so these negatives will cancel out and delta becomes positive. So if we choose delta to equal negative one over m, then for our actual proof here, we can say, suppose that delta is equal to negative one over m, which means that we have negative of negative one over m is less than x, which means that we have x greater than one over m, which just means that one over x is going to be less than m, and you just proved it, you're done. And now that we proved these two statements, that these are positive and negative infinity, 
we can say, well, these are not equal, obviously, because they're one's positive infinity, one's negative infinity, and therefore, the actual two-sided limit does not exist, and you can put out a QED because you've technically proved that. So that's a really nice way to do it. Is there, another, is this, does this work for every case, though? Let's take a look. So if we look at the example of this horrifying function here, you might be thinking, what the heck is going on here? Well, this is called f of x equals sine of 1 over x. Let me introduce you formally. So you think about what happens at 0 with this function. At 0, 1 over 0 is undefined, so the limit does not exist. So sine of undefined, well, it's not defined. But if you take the limit from 0 positive, then it approaches positive infinity on the inside. But then sine at infinity will forever oscillate back and forth, so you never really know what's going to happen, so it's not defined. And if you take the 1 over x from the, as x goes to 0 from the negative, you get negative infinity, where it's the same case. Sine just keeps oscillating. So what do you do? Well, I'm going to show you. Unfortunately, you cannot split this into the limit as x goes to 0 positive of sine of 1 over x, um, and then show that that's not equal to the limit as x goes to 0 from the negative. Why? Because, again, if you take 0 from the positive, we just said that that's not defined. It'll forever oscillate. And the same here. So these are both non-existent. So when we're trying to look for the limit, right, or prove for that the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 1 over x does not exist, by splitting it into these two other um, statements that both do not exist, we're just doing extra work. So we might as well just tackle the actual two-sided limit right away. Now. Remember, talking about the negation of epsilon delta. If we can just find one epsilon that works or that will fail to make there be a delta for which the function is within delta or epsilon of the limit, then we're done. So we do what's called a proof by contradiction. We assume a certain statement's true, and then we find a contradiction, and we disprove it. So assume, we say, and we say, for the sake of contradiction, FSC, that the limit exists, right? That the limit, as x goes to 0, of sine of 1 over x is a finite real value called L, all right? Then we know by definition of a limit that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0, such that if absolute value of x is less than delta, then we can imply right away that sine of 1 over x is going to be within epsilon of its limit, all right? Now the key here is we can find just one epsilon that does not work. And this should be true for all epsilon. So let's just look at the diagram again. We know that the values near 0 will forever oscillate between negative 1 and 1. So if we pick a value of epsilon that's less than 1 or negative 1, then how can we guarantee that at any point the function will always be within epsilon of the limit? We can't because it's forever oscillating. So a good value, in my opinion, is epsilon equals 1 half because you cannot guarantee that the function will stay inside those bounds. So let's say let epsilon equal 1 half. And now we're going to set this aside. Why are we going to set it aside? Because we want to find a statement and manipulate it algebraically now so that we can find two points, perhaps a certain amount delta away, from 0. So let's say x1 and x2. That when you take sine of 1 over x of those, of those points, you're going to be outside of epsilon. So what do I mean? Let's start with considering the um, range of sine of 1 over x. Remember, it's negative 1 and 1. So the distance from 1 to negative 1 is equal to 2, right? And now, oh, that's an ugly 2, let me change that real quickly. But now, remember, we have two points. At one of them is going to be corresponding to negative 1, and one of them is corresponding to 1. So we call the one point x1 and x2. Now, this might seem confusing, but all we're doing is picking two sampling points such that when we take f of x1, we get 1, and we take f of x2, we get negative 1. Okay? So then we can say that this is going to be the same thing as sine of 1 over x1, right, minus sine of 1 over x2, because that's the output. Now, would you agree with me that if I added something and subtracted something at the same time within this absolute value, nothing would change? So what do I mean? Let's just add a value in here. And what value are we going to add? We're going to add L and subtract L. And yes, that's right. It's the same L from the beginning. So we do this. And now, this, this doesn't change at all from, from this last step, OK? But what we're going to do is we're going to split this into two inequalities, or into two absolute values. So let's rearrange this. We get sine of 1 over x1 minus l plus 
L minus sine of 1 over x2. I just want to rearrange these L's because now we can put parentheses around them. And now, by the triangle inequality, which you should remember from our pre previous lessons, it says that this statement here is less than or equal to, separately, sine of 1 over x1 minus 1 plus, or minus L, sorry, I got mixed up there, plus L minus sine of 1 over x2, right? But notice that L minus sine of 1 over x2 is the same thing as negative sine of 1 over x2 minus L. And because the absolute value of negative y is equal to the absolute value of y, there's no difference between absolute value of negative 2 and absolute value of 2, then we can just say that this is true. So we can just take out this negative here, and we can get rid of this, and we can put this in the bars instead. Or That's a wrong place to put the bar. Anyways, here we go. But now, notice what we have from our definition of epsilon delta. We say that sine of 1 over x for any x should be within epsilon of the limit which means that this expression here should be less than epsilon, and this expression here should also be less than epsilon. But remember, we said epsilon is equal to 1 half, so this should be true for epsilon equal to 1 half, which means that this entire expression is strictly less than 1 half plus 1 half, which equals 1. Now again, you might be thinking, what's the whole point of this entire expression? We just showed that it's equal to 1. But if you were paying attention, you should be off the edge of your seat right now, because we started with 2. So we somehow show through some train of thought that 2 is going to be less than 1. So we have a contradiction, and we write that out loud. We have a contradiction, and we assume that, and we yell it out triumphantly. We found a contradiction. We found that 2 is less than 1, which, if that's true, then we broke mathematics, and we should win all the awards in the world, but it's clearly not. So this is clearly false, all right? Which means, where did we go wrong? Well, we didn't do anything wrong in these steps here. These are all totally justified, which means that the initial assumption, all the way from the beginning, that the limit exists and is equal to finite value L is actually false. So we say, therefore, our initial assumption was false. All right, that's going to take a while for me to write this out. There you go. That's quite messy, but you get it. Was false, which means therefore, three dots, that the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 1 over x does not exist. And you've shown that using contradiction. So that's a QED. You deserve it. All right. So let's take a look at what we did. Remember that this function has this weird oscillat infinitely oscillatory nature between negative 1 and 1. We never know where the function is going to be between negative 1 and 1 at 0, strictly at 0. So we take advantage of that. We find two points whose values are the extremes, negative 1 and 1, such that when you plug them into sine of 1 over x, you get negative 1 and 1. And what that's going to do is if we start with something like 2, and we expand that into the absolute value, and we plug in those functions values in there, and then we manipulate it more algebraically. Remember that a lot of epsilon delta throughout your journey has, has been algebraic manipulations. So we manipulate it algebraically. We split it with triangle inequality, which we learned a while ago. We also use the idea of absolute value of negative y is equal to the absolute value of y. So a lot of concepts that have been coming back have been showing up again. And we proved that 2 is less than 1, which is not true, which means that the limit does not exist. So this is the more sophisticated way to prove that a limit does not exist using epsilon delta. And this is very interesting to me, that you can use epsilon delta not just to prove that the limit exists, but also that it does not exist. And I hope that you've really enjoyed this video, um, a bit of a bonus, if you will, and understood, grasped with your arsenal of epsilon delta techniques and tools and concepts under your belt, finally able to solve the strongest and hardest problems of epsilon delta. So I wanted to say thank you so much for watching this five-part mini-series on Josh Academy, Understanding Epsilon Delta. I really hope that you, if you were struggling with Epsilon Delta before, you understand it quite better now, and that uh, you enjoyed the videos all as a whole. So please make sure to leave a like, to subscribe to Josh Academy, and check out the new um, and more videos that are being uploaded all the time, because we have a lot of cool math concepts up here. So I salute you for braving your way through the forest of Epsilon Delta and not giving up. Thank you.